Welcome to our uh, first annual Ladies Equip You uh, Bible study and teaching time. Uh, we have, uh, did everybody get a packet? Everybody's got a packet from the back? Excellent. Um, a couple of things, just a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Number one, be reminded, uh, this section right here, you will, if you whisper or anything else, it will be recorded for all of posterity and put out on the internet. Uh, that thing picks up things that uh, other things don't. I uh, found that out two Sundays ago when I whispered something under my breath about my stupid computer, which nobody in the uh, congregate or in the sanctuary heard, but everyone listening online heard. So just uh, be mindful of that, you all that are here in this front row. Secondly, uh, if it's not comfortable here, because we talked about there's going to be some writing at the end of the night tonight, just be thinking through, we will move to the ministry house if that would be more comfortable because we have tables set up. Uh, we like the proximity here, the lighting, just multiple other reasons to be in here. Uh, and I've been told that ladies can multitask and do all kinds of amazing things, and they don't need no table. They can write perfectly neatly. Uh, I need all the help I can get to read my writing afterwards. Uh, you can see some of that in my notes here. So uh, do I will ask that question. Someone remind me just to take a kind of consensus at the end of the night uh, on those things as we kind of get ready for... It's about a six-week class. Uh, the other thing I would say is this is not like a normal class maybe that you participate in a Bible study or those things. Uh, this is for your benefit to learn. So if you have questions, just let me know, right? And we'll walk through them at the time of the question as we're going through the material. That book is yours to keep. Please, uh, there will be notes. There will be homework. Uh, again, that's not going to be graded necessarily. It's something for you as you come to this class desiring to go further, we're going to give you some homework each week. This is yours. I encourage you, write in it, right? There's going to be things I'm saying to you tonight that are not necessarily on this page. And that's why you have the spaces in here to write into that. So with that, I am going to open us with a word of prayer and we'll get started with our time this evening. <clears throat> Lord, as we uh, gather for the purpose of knowing you more fully, Lord, it certainly is coming in the form of how to study your word, uh, but Lord, we know that the point of your word is that we might know you, that we might know your will for us, and that through that, we might be more conformed to who you are. Lord, I pray uh, for these ladies who are here tonight, I pray for their husbands, uh, many of whom are home with children and other things, that this would be a fruitful time. We know how busy everyone's schedule is, and so Lord, we want to uh, make this worthy of the effort that they put into it, and Lord, honoring to you. And so we ask for all of these things tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, what I want to work through, just as an introduction tonight, is a right view of what is Scripture. Uh, and there's going to be a question at the beginning of this that is probably the only time you're going to hear this type of a question asked. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're going to learn that basically this question I'm about to ask you is a no-no in almost every part of our study, except for the beginning, because we have to establish rightly what is your view of this. So our first question, I just want you to think through, what is Scripture to you? When you think through uh, this, the Bible, Scripture, a book of the Bible, a chapter of the Bible, a verse in the Bible... What is it that you think of whenever you're thinking of Scripture? If someone says, well, God's Word says, or the Bible says, how is that viewed? Do you, do you see it as it is in every instance? I know that when I ask a question like that, everyone here is saying, well, it's the Word of God, right? It's authoritative, it's this, it's that. But do you see it that way when you're reading it for your morning devotions? Do you see it that way whenever you are hearing it taught from the pulpit or in one of the studies? In other words, what I want to begin, especially if any of you are going to be teaching more fully, through this is an idea of this is how it has to be every time you approach it, especially in preparation to then explain it, to share it, to articulate it to someone else. What Scripture is, is quite simply, it is the mind of God, it is the words of our Creator that He graciously recorded for us, so that we might know him and know his will for us. It's unchanging. It is complete. It's authoritative. And it is life-giving. These are all ways in which it describes itself. These are some of the things that I want you to start per permeating into your thought process. When you're approaching a study of God's word, 
there should be a pause, and we're going to talk about what that looks like. What are some ways to prepare prior to your study? But there should be a pause where you're preparing your heart, your mind for, I'm about to go to the words of my Creator that I might know Him and might know His will. So let me give you some things that will uh, potentially help you with that. A, a verse that will help direct your view. Uh, it's a very familiar verse. It is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. For some reason, when I printed this, it did not bring all of it with me. So let me turn it in real quick. And it is verse 16, a familiar text, but it's a reminder for us how it is that we're to view the Word of God. And in this, the Apostle Paul tells us all Scripture is inspired or breathed out by God. That's the first terminology that, that we should be preparing our minds for. When you open this, it's not just a book. It's not just words on paper. It's not just uh, a letter to Timothy. It is much more than that. It is the very words of God. Therefore, it carries with it everything of his character, meaning it is authoritative because it's his. It is uh, perfectly given because it's his. So there are multiple things, connotations that come with the recognition of the inspiration of Scripture. By the way, there's a little word in there that really should stand out. Anyone see that in that first phrase we read? All. All, exactly. There's no, there's no delineation of, well, the pastoral epistles are super inspired and the you know, Song of Solomon that's only semi-inspired. Or the book of Genesis, because it's an oral tradition that was given until Moses. All of it is supernaturally given by God. And that's an important distinction to begin with. So all scripture is inspired by God. And then we have this next statement. It's profitable. It's profitable. Now we're going to explain how to, and you guys are going to learn how to sort out the different parts of these phrases and things throughout the course of this class. But for tonight... I just want us to begin with a right view of these things. And so all scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable. It has, it has profitability to you. There's no wasted space. There's no words which are unimportant. Uh, there are no sections of this that you don't need to bother to learn about, to connect into, or to understand. All of it is profitable. And then it says, for what? What, what is it profitable for? Teaching. For teaching, okay? So think about that. How does Scripture teach? It's amazing when it attaches a verb to something that is inanimate. How does something inanimate accomplish something? How does it do in an active sense? It teaches. Well, how does it do that? Well, Scripture gives us guidance for the lives that He has planned for us. This is His Word, and, and it gives us that guidance for what He has planned for us. And it does so by teaching us first about Him... And then secondly, about his will for us. What's the second thing that scripture is profitable for? Rebuke. Reproof or rebuke. So with reproof, uh, the second thing, so it begins with it teaches us about him. It's profitable for teaching. The theme of scripture is God. And so that's the first thing that it's going to do. But then in that, it has reproof. In other words, it's, secondly, it teaches us about us. It teaches us about us and our struggles and because we recognize whose word it is, or it's intended that we would take heed to inconsistencies in our lives and his words and repent and change. So it teaches because it becomes the block or the uh, mold that we lay our lives against and see, well, where, where is it not fitting? <laughs> right? What does scripture say that my life doesn't fit? So it becomes that picture that we then examine ourselves against. So within that, it teaches and it reproofs us or rebukes us. What's the third thing? Correction. Correction. This, guys, this is so cool. I hope you're starting to see this. Because too many times people get bogged down when it comes to God's word or God's will for them that's being taught to them through and from Scripture that they get to a place where they uh, feel judgment, they feel guilt, and they feel all many number of things and they stop there. And Scripture was never intended to stop there. It does have to take you there, but it was never intended to stop there. It was given 
uh, for correction as well. In other words, proving guilt is not the intent of Scripture. It is one of the aims of Scripture. It's one of the necessities of Scripture, but it's not the intent. Guarding, shaping, maturing are better terms that are more fitting for what is the overall picture of Scripture that we have in the singular verse. Scripture is not given that you might feel guilty and then carry that guilt around uh, with offense and, and hurt and struggle and wrong view. Scripture is given so that it might reveal guilt by revealing God, His will for you, and you, in examination of that, recognize inconsistencies. Through that, then there's intended to be correction. Then do this. Right? If we find those, he says, in, for example, in 1 John, that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. It, it, sin is not revealed simply so you can take a, a punch to the gut and then carry that around all day with a woe begone face. It's revealed with the intent of correction. And that's a massive truth for us to understand about God's Word that should be helpful for you as you're trying to articulate it to your children, uh, to the different classes and different ways in which you participate, life on life, with family members, with co-workers. As you're walking through this, understand you can't skip over guilt. You can't skip over inconsistencies or sin, which is being revealed by Scripture. We don't skip that. We don't say, well, we're going to take a pass on this area because our culture is against it right now or because... It's so common that it's no longer seen uh, like people think I'm crazy that I think this is sinful. No, remember what we went back to. What do we begin with? A right view of what this is. If this is your creator, if these are his words that are given to you, and you begin with that mindset, and you're going to understand more fully, especially when you begin to articulate or teach this to someone else, if you are not rock solid, steadfastly convinced, of these simple truths that we're laying out, you will have a hard time conveying to others these same truths. Because you'll likely be talking to someone who themselves is not convinced of that. And so you are going to have to be able to stand firm, steadfast, irresolute, immovable are some of the ways in which Scripture describes it. Understanding that it's given, it's profitable, it is His Word, all of it, and it's profitable for these things, and then the final one, uh, as scripture, as, sorry, as scripture shines light into our failures, it also gives direction for correcting them. It never abandons us to, thou art the worm, and thou shalt always just be the worm. It says, thou art the worm, therefore God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that he might redeem your wormhood into righteousness, for he who knew no sin became sin, so that in him you might be righteous for he in love adopted us as children he in love lavished his grace and so there's a measure where when you're going through scripture if you find yourself where all you're doing is hammering this is what's wrong but you're not giving pathways either in your own study for your own struggles forward or in your articulation to your children uh, or to others that you're giving scripture to if there's not a pathway forward in how correction right, is coming, then, then you're not using Scripture to its full profitability. And then ultimately, this is the final descriptor, it's for training in righteousness. All of these profitable things culminate in and are summarized by this phrase. We are all in training in righteousness. None of us have arrived. The Apostle Paul says with clarity in Philippians chapter 3, he has not arrived. If the Apostle Paul, 30 years into his ministry, at the time he's writing the letter to the church in Philippi, had not yet arrived, if the Apostle Paul, who went to the third heaven, if the Apostle Paul, who was taught by the Lord himself, if the Apostle Paul, who spent nine years in preparation before he went on his first missionary journey, if that guy, 30 years later, had not yet arrived, none of us have arrived. And that's okay. Paul's not saying it in a derogatory sense. He's saying it in a recognizable sense, in an encouraging sense of, okay, this is where we're at. But are we stuck there? No, because we've been given God's holy word that is profitable for all of these things, ultimately, so that we who are being trained in righteousness are done so through the lens of what is his word. The study that we're embarking on, ladies, is intended to give each of you a greater ability in accomplishing the task of studying God's Word so that you might understand it and then share it with others. That's the simplicity of our goal. 
I need simple. We've talked about that. You guys know that who are part of our church. I need a simple goal. I need to be able to break it down to what is the simplest common denominator of what we're trying to accomplish. And at the end of the day, that's it. I want you, number one, to be able to know this more fully. And then number two, we're going to give you some tools that will help you then to articulate it to others. To communicate the truths that you yourself are learning and then take that to others. So here are some pre-sermon work workout type things that I go through. So you, in a pre-study sense, these are some areas that will help you in the, in the preparation of your mind for what it is you're embarking on. Uh, number one, you need to humbly desire to arrive at God's meaning of the text. You need to humbly desire to arrive at God's meaning in the text. If you approach Scripture with any other intent, you are approaching Scripture from a wrong foundation. And we do that all the time. We approach Scripture with the intent of, I need some hope for the day ahead of me. That's not how Scripture was intended. Scripture is not a stepladder that's given to you to climb out of the hole you find yourself in. Scripture is a light and a lamp unto your path that helps you go around those holes and learn from them. Um, so that has to be first and foremost. I'm not looking to find the uh, most acceptable interpretation. I'm not looking to find that which is going to draw the biggest crowd. I'm not looking at that which will be pleasing to the person I'm speaking to. When I approach, I'm not looking for that which makes my heart feel glad uh, simply because it's encouraged me or, or pushed me forward into, man, I'm on the right path. That's not why we come to Scripture. We come to Scripture to study it, to know one single thing at the forefront. What has God said? You have to do so with humility. You have to prepare yourself for that. I come to Scripture every time and I want to be careful. I don't care if it's John 3.16. I want to approach it in my study with the lens of God. Have I understood rightly what you're saying in this? Not, well, I know what that means. We can just move on down. Listen, John 3.16 is one of the most profound truths in all of Scripture. We should never flash past those things, and yet those things which become common, that we think, well, of course I know what that means. I've heard it my entire life. That's what we want to be careful of. We want this to be a slowed-down recognition. Um, the second thing, if you'll turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2... By the way, as you're in preparation at each of these levels, this should be a part of your prayer life in preparation. Before I even get to a place of study, I pray that I would have humility. Lord, make sure that my heart is humble before you. Lord, if there's anything in my heart that's distracted, anything that's got a presupposition that I ought not to have about this text, anything that is coming to this without a desire to know what it is you have said, Lord, Humble me to see that, that I might confess it and move on. The second thing, and this is all part of what brings that humility, I have to recognize my own inadequacy. I'm not, gonna, I'm not giving you all a secret method that if you just plug this in, you're going to get all the crossword uh, words to the crossword puzzle right. That's never how Scripture works. This is not uh, your McDonald's drive through version of Bible study so that with these tools, you can, you can take shortcuts and arrive there. There's no such thing. Um, so recognize your own inadequacy. We're going to look at a passage in just a moment. But then on top of that, you recognize that, but you don't stop there. Right? Scripture doesn't call us to the study of it so that we can be paralyzed by our inabilities. But if we don't start by recognizing our inabilities, we'll come with a proud heart and a proud mind and it will cloud our ability to study that. Some of the things that people have said over the years, professors, we come to our study of Scripture so that Scripture might uh, rule over us. We don't come so that we might have a rule over Scripture. I don't come to a point of Scripture so that I can say, look at this, Philip has this nailed down now. I come and I know that Philip is understanding this when it's having impact over Philip. I, I do not become an authority over Scripture, ever. 
That's not the intent of the goal. If you're coming with a desire, what that will be revealing, just so you're aware, is that you have a desire for others to see you as higher than they ought to see you. I learned a long time ago from many, many learned men for many years in ministry, they would say things like, if you're going to be in ministry, you have to believe that you're the least important person in the room. It makes a lot of sense when you start reading scripture and understanding how Christ himself describes those things. If you're coming to scripture with an idea to, man, I just want to be so theologically accurate. I just want to have this nailed down. I want to own this, so to speak. What you're coming with is a heart that says, I want others to see how good I can do with this. If you can come to it with a, God, what have you said? It doesn't matter what I think you said. It doesn't matter what I've heard over the years you've said. I'm coming to this study, and I'm doing everything in my power to clean this slate. I'm going to come as blank as I possibly can to a study of God's Word, especially if it's with the intent of then teaching it. So you have to, number one, rec- or number two, recognize your inadequacy. And number two, you have to also believe God has made it possible. Look with me just for a moment at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It's such an amazing picture of the Apostle Paul. And there's little idiosyncrasies about each of the authors of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is one who would oftentimes ask a question, then go off on a rabbit trail and come back to it later. If you don't recognize that at times, it will become very confusing for you in your study of who is the singular most uh, definitive author in the, the pages of Scripture. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 16 when I speak of our inadequacy. Uh, we'll start in verse 14 and down, sorry, of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death unto death. To the other, an aroma from life unto life. And who is adequate for these things? Now, the Apostle Paul just revealed a ton about how we should view ministry in general. But he makes this basic statement at the end. He asks this question, who is adequate for these things? Now, he's saying it not in a singular question of, I want you to answer it. What he's saying is he recognizes his own inadequacy. Who can possibly be adequate? And what he's saying is, it doesn't matter the response of the people. When I share the gospel, I am sharing that which is an aroma of death unto those who will reject it. And I don't change it. It is what it is according to God and His intent. My job is to share it with all clarity. And in that, I recognize through the sharing of the gospel, I am sharing that which is death unto those who are perishing. But it is life unto those who are being saved. And I don't get to change that. It's not your job to manipulate it. You are not striving to be the best salesman ever and figure out how to close the deal on people's struggles with Scripture. It doesn't rule out that we're ambassadors. It doesn't rule out that we plead. It doesn't rule out the other things that we see in Scripture. And you're going to see that more fully in in our understanding of how to connect dots against the whole of Scripture. But very clearly, Paul's saying here is, listen, this is my inadequacy. I share... And what I'm sharing is life and death itself. And he's speaking of the gospel. Now, then he goes on and he talks about, listen, this is we don't peddle the word of God. And you see all this, but jump down to verses four and five of chapter three. We go through a few uh, verses where Paul's kind of off on a rabbit trail of saying, guys, you need to see this is not who we are. But then he says this, such confidence we have through Christ towards God Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. So the Apostle Paul recognizes his inadequacy, but he's not paralyzed by it. He's not stuck in that. He jumps from, okay, in humility, I know. I know that this is what God is doing through us. However, I know that in that I have to get up and keep moving forward. It's such a beautiful picture of that, and it's the way that we should approach God's words to us. Who's adequate for these things? I never feel adequate in any season of preaching in the the pulpit. I never, ever get up there and feel like I have got this nailed down. After today, I never need to think of this again. By no means. It should never be that. Uh, My desire is to know it to the fullest extent. 
and to trust in the adequacy that God himself brings to it, having called men to be teachers of his word in the church. In the same way as he's called you and given you opportunity to be that same fragrance within the circles that you have been given, whether it be in lady studies, whether it be in your home, whether it be amongst family, whether it be co-workers, whether it be friends, whatever it may be, to whom you are sharing with these truths, it's still the same truth. When you speak to your friends, to your children, you're speaking from the same pages that I stand in the pulpit and speak from. The foundation of what it is doesn't change. The foundation of where it comes from doesn't change. And that's what I want you got you ladies to start seeing most clearly from this first time together is what are we doing? What are we dealing with? What are we actually handling here? Are we just handling a book where we need to work through some grammatical truths and understand a few things in context and, and those things so that we can have this nailed down? And no. Man, we are we are handling life and death. That's how the Apostle Paul describes it. Uh, if you guys know my friend Brody, he says, listen, when Scripture is described as a sword, to put it in modern day terms, he said, it's like having a loaded gun. And he said, you don't just give a loaded gun to someone that doesn't know how to handle a loaded gun and hope they figure it out. Right? You are careful and you are working through with much oversight to accomplish those things. It's described as a weapon. <clears throat> and we need to rightly see it in that light. Then, jump back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. How do we do this? Like, what is our role? Recognizing uh, that we are inadequate, but trusting that God has made us adequate and given us these things. Uh, what is it that we are to do? Um, what's our role? Right, Timothy, or Paul says, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. There's a measure where Paul was constantly laying out what was his goal. Well, for us, as it pertains specifically to a study of God's word, look at verse 14 and uh, look at verse 15 of chapter 2 in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. All right, let's think about this for just a minute. There, there's a lot happening here. The word diligent, how many of you guys understand the term diligent? Worthy labor. Diligent is work. Okay? Diligent is work. Sometimes, and I'll never forget, uh, I heard one time where a pastor was saying on a difficult passage, I was teaching through the book of James, and I came to this very difficult section with the uh, prayer of the elders, the uh, anointing with oil, and there's a multitude of different understandings surrounding that passage uh, with healing and, and other things that go into it. And one pastor that I admire very much, who had been a ministry for a long time, had just expressed that when he came to that passage, he can just remember knowing it was going to be difficult, having prepared for weeks ahead that it was coming. And when it came time to teach that, in the week prior to teaching it, he said, I can remember spending hours in my study praying that God would give me the understanding of this very difficult text that it, that it stymied and created so much controversy and differences of views and other things. And then he made this statement. He says, you know, I found that when I put my butt in the chair, God always answers that prayer. And what he was saying is a recognition of this, this diligence, that he would come with humility and prayer, but he also knew that there was a labor on the backside of this. That it was going to come through labor and diligence that he might understand and present this. Now, the second part of this, and it's so important, to present yourself approved to who? Okay. Why is that important? Who wants to take a stab at that? Oh, exactly. When you're teaching, who are you teaching to? Yes, yes, but no. First, your audience is God. When you're teaching God's word, your first audience is God. Everybody else gets to listen in. On any given Sunday morning, that's my desired goal. I recognize that above everything else, I don't care if everybody in the church leaves mad. If God's pleased. If God's pleased, if I rightly divided his text, then the rest of it doesn't matter. Right? I'm an aroma 
according to His will, to His use. Period. When it comes to the study of God's Word and to the proclamation or teaching of God's Word, you need to understand that before you go any further into it. We don't compromise. We have a singular goal. What hath God said? Anything else I offer you doesn't have the power that God's words have. Any other opinion. Now, if there's some illustrations and other things that can help you more fully see that, great. And we're going to talk about how to arrive at those things. However, understanding this, your singular audience, any time that you are expounding on or teaching God's word, is not whoever's in front of you hearing it. Right? It's Him first. It, I don't care how cute you can be with it. I don't care uh, how many stories you can tell. I don't care how enraptured your children or the ladies you're teaching or whoever it is in front of you is with your presentation. If you didn't get the text right, what would you do? Told a nice story. Right? And you have, we have to have that understanding. And we're going to talk about how to arrive at that and how to avoid things. Um, so he goes on and says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman. There's that language again of labor. Who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling or dividing the word of truth. That terminology that's used there is a picture of cutting it straight. Um, if you've ever seen someone working with wood, if they don't cut the board straight, it never fits properly the way it was intended. There will always be that gap. There will be that opportunity for weather and other things to get in there for that understanding. So when he says, cut it straight, rightly divide, what he's saying very simply is we need to do the work to get it right. And listen, we don't want to be arrogant. I have to use tools. I use squares and other things when I'm cutting lumber. In the same way, I have to labor with the tools that God has graciously given so that I might arrive uh, at, a, at a message, at a teaching time that is before the Lord as the audience. And then your fourth step. Uh, sorry. Fifth step. Humbly desire to arrive at God's uh, meaning, our primary goal. Uh, recognize your inadequacy. Believe God has made you adequate. Bring a worthy effort. And the fifth one, preach it to yourself until you know. You're your second audience. God's your first, but you're the second audience. <clears throat> if you're going to teach someone from God's Word, you've got to know that you know this is what it is. Not with arrogance, with humility. With boldness. You have to preach it to yourself until you know. So, if you look on your sheet, how do we arrive at the author's message? How do we get there? Because that's the goal. Think of it in this term. We spoke in terms of God, but let's take the human author, right? Because each of them are different. They were all instruments that God used uniquely to the accomplishment of this amazing gift he's given us of his words. So picture in your mind, if you were teaching to someone from... 1 Peter. The goal would be that if Peter were sitting in the front row, he would say to you afterwards, man, you, you could, well done. That's what, I, that's what I meant. That was what I intended when I wrote that. Through the Holy Spirit, that was my intent. So that's the thing you should be asking, and you're going to see that reflected in the homework you're going to have tonight. <clears throat> you also have to recognize what is it this is intending to do, do in your life. Number one, understanding the author's message in the original context. Number two, if at the end of your preparation you don't have a better picture of God, a more complete picture, or maybe it's one you've always had, but it's so fresh through your study that it's humbled you, that it's renewed you, there should be a measure. We don't go to God's Word simply to prepare to teach it. That's a dangerous, dangerous thought. We must go to God's Word so that we might be transformed by it and then share with others that transformation that He's brought through our effort and study. That's the picture who we want to know. <clears throat> and the way you'll know that's happening is you'll see in your life that you're more conformed to the image of Christ. Where do we find the image of Christ, ladies? On the pages of Scripture. That's where those things are found. So with that, um, 
Oh, I don't have the new updated one. No, yeah, I made some changes to it, and I'm missing it. I borrow your report. So in your study, you have four helpful questions. You're going to get a lot of questions. There's some things in your appendix we're going to look at. There's a lot more questions. I, this is why you guys have heard me joke that my wife and I don't study together. I mean, we don't, I don't joke. I mean, I talk about it with seriousness. Because I have an adversarial relationship with the text because God himself has called me to be a teacher of the text. So I'm not content with simply coming to a place of me understanding it to a place of satisfaction. My desire is to understand it to the place where I know it so that I can teach it. And that doesn't come through just reading and walking through basic things. We're going to look at that in just a minute from, from what I'm preparing to teach tomorrow night. Uh, a passage that I think is very familiar. Certainly for me it has been. And when I started to tear it apart to teach it, it is not at all what I have thought for so many years. And, and I'm excited to just... I'm this far into it, so I'm going to show you guys a little bit of a glimpse of how these beginning processes work in that. <clears throat> um, so here's four helpful questions. What is the writer saying? What's the writer saying? When you're studying scripture, ask yourself that. What's the writer saying? We're going to talk about a better... Your homework will be focused on how to accomplish that. Number two, what does the Bible say about this in other places? Guys, what that simply means is this. If you're reading something in Scripture, and at the end of that section, you come to the conclusion, oh my goodness, I can lose my salvation. The problem is, is that's a contradiction to what other passages say. Scripture, being inspired by God, who is perfect and holy, will never contradict itself. So if you're arriving at a conclusion from your study that is a contradiction to some other part of Scripture, especially another part of Scripture that's abundantly clear, um, then you need to take a step back and start over. And sometimes I'll jump over and make sure, okay, did I get the other text wrong? Like maybe I'm thinking that this particular passage means something and it doesn't, and this passage is correcting that for me. you got to do the work. This is where the work comes in. But... Ask yourself that question, because if not, you can easily come to a place where you're like, man, this is so clear. I totally see this. Oh my goodness, I never knew this before. I can't wait to share this with everybody. This is a new truth that I previously had not thought through, but here it's saying this. And I just, I just need to put this on Facebook and let everyone know about what God's revealed to me today. A guardianship against that is, what does the Bible say about this in other places? With your conclusion, is there any contradictions that you're aware of? And we're going to look at how to search that out through word studies and other things as this class advances. Uh, number three, little spelling error that should be teach. <laughs> what does this teach me about God? Um, just a little helpful hint. It's not in your notes. Um, everything in Scripture falls in five categories. Everything. Right? It's either going to teach you about God, it's going to teach you about yourself, it's going to teach you about God's answer to the problem that He, being who He is, and you being who you are, present. Right? That's the gospel. It's going to tell you then what to do about it. That's our salvation and sanctification, repentance, belief, study, whole armor of God. Those are passages that are telling us now what do we do, and then future things. This is what's coming next. Every verse on the pages of Scripture will have one of those or more. Some verses will teach you about God, yourself, and what's coming next all in the same verse. right? But every one of them will have that singular or some combination of those five categories. People ask me all the time, how do you do Q&As on the fly? Because you understand that every question comes into a category that's very specific to those things in Scripture. It's not about what the person's asked as much as what are they really asking and what's the answer to it. So uh, those things, what does this teach me about God? Because the singular theme of Scripture, right, the singular theme of Scripture is Him. It's His story. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's His. It's the means by which He reveals Himself to us. The fullness of who He is. Uh, this is a wonderful truth. We can have a glimpse that there is a God 
by creation, beautiful sunrises, things that are, are bigger than. But unbelievers uh, can never take that and translate it into knowing God. Right? How do I know that? Anyone want to guess how I know that? Who said it? Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. For that which is true about God, God has made known about Himself. His invisible attributes since the beginning of creation. Through creation, He has revealed to this world. But then He tells us why He did that. And this is where it gets so terrifying because people will tell me, oh, you know, I worship God and, you know, and the mountains are my cathedral. Okay, here's the problem. The mountains can only bring condemnation. The mountains, how do I know that? Because Romans chapter 1 says that the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness. Then he goes into the understanding that he's revealed himself with invisible attributes through his creation so that men are without excuse. That phrase tells me very clearly that natural revelation, sunrises and sunsets and the, the, the care of God for the seasons and the other things and the intricate... Uh, intricate realities of the human eyeball and all these things that we hear about are beautiful amazing truths that point to God and only bring condemnation so that men are without excuse he has made himself known through natural revelation that he exists but by his proclaimed gospel is the only way by which men can be saved it is only through special or supernatural revelation that salvation and not condemnation can be brought to a person. Such an important truth. And you see that. That's why Romans 10, a little bit later, says, right, that who can be saved unless the gospel is preached and who will preach unless they're sent. And, and you hear those things. People will say all the time things like, you know, preach the gospel and use words if you must. It's a contradiction to Scripture. You must use words or the gospel is not preached. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't also live it out. Of course you have to live it out. That's also taught elsewhere. But you have to proclaim the gospel or else men are only condemned. This is such important truth that comes through that. So what does this teach me about God? So many times the greatest struggle that we seem to have in our every generation, but certainly in the generation that we all live in, is that we have a wrong view of who He is. We've made him Santa Claus, a genie in a bottle, uh, you know, the great giver of karma, a soda machine that we put our change into to get our desired outcome. We've made him so many things that he's not. And the only corrective reality we have is right here. That's why. This is where he's given that we might know him. In other words, one of the struggles, and, and I notice it so often, when I would speak to some of the more popular uh, church groups, um, you know, that draw the biggest crowds oftentimes. Uh, I'll speak to people that have been there and I'm like, well, how did that, they, I'm trying to think how to say this. They would say things like, you know, I never learned this truth about God. I saw him only as, as all loving. Well, he is that. But then ask, for example, if I ask a question of someone in that, so what do you do with Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, we don't deal with the Old Testament. Literally, that would be the statement. What do you do with the realities of fill in the blank, right? How do you deal with, for example, do you know what the commands given unto Moses were for any Israelite who broke the Sabbath? And here's the picture, just so you understand this. If they found one of their brothers or sisters gathering firewood for their cooking fire on the Sabbath, what were they commanded by God to do with that brother or sister? Stone them. How do you fit that into the modern day picture of God? You're left with this complete, I don't know what to do with that. And what you have is a lacking view of God. It's a lacking view of the totality of God. What do I do with all of the, let's go New Testament. What do you do with Ananias and Sapphira? I didn't even hear some of the stuff. I remember teaching through that at one point using that example. And I had some college students who came to me and said that their professor had told them that that was actually just a unique fluke where they both had a heart attack on the same day because they were eating the wrong kind of food or something. I mean, literally, that was what they were being taught in their uh, biblical worldview studies. That Ananias and Sapphira had a heart attack. 
um, on the same day, according to the Apostle Peter or some term of that. The point is, what is that teaching us? That when God says things like the point of the man wants to die and then the judgment, he absolutely means it. And we have physical illustrations and examples that help us to know and trust that. When we have passages like Psalms 51, where he says, listen, you thought I was just like you, right? I will tear you to pieces and there will be none to deliver. How do we take the God who's being preached today and then reconcile those verses with him? Well, it's very easy. It's his word. It's profitable. It gives us those recognitions of a righteous fear and reverence of God. It gives me a greater joy in my salvation to know the fullness of what I've been saved from. I mean, think about it in terms of the gospel. The very word salvation. If I said to you guys, oh my goodness, I had a crazy weekend. I went to the beach. I never go to the beach. This crazy rip current top caught me. And uh, a lifeguard there saved me. You would understand by the terminology I'm using, saved, I was saved from something. Saved from what? Rip current. Saved from drowning. Right? Saved from being sucked out to sea. You would be able to connect something simply by the word I used, what was going on in the context of it, that a lifeguard, the beach, those types of things. Well, in the same way, we throw, away ter- throw around terms like, God save me. Oh, what did he save you from? Have you ever thought of that? What does God save you from? His wrath. His wrath. Mm-hmm. Right? Think through those terminology to the fullest extent. That's why Jesus himself says, don't fear the one who can kill the body. But fear the one after the body is dead who will cast the soul into hell for eternity. Mm-hmm. That's not Satan, y'all. Satan does not himself carry that authority and capability. That's specifically about one singular entity, God himself. So, in understanding those things, it's important to have the full picture of Scripture. Too many people never have a fear of God, and they jump to a thinking that they have a love for God. Without a fear of God, there's no beginning of that wisdom, and there can be no love for God. You might love Him very much, but you probably come to love Jesus and not Jesus. And that's just a hard truth that we can labor if we begin with a right understanding to be to, at the forefront. What is it that we're actually opening? This is not a great book. It's not a wonderful uh, guideline for our lives. This is the very word of our Creator. So that we might know Him. Because to know Him only according to the sunrise and the sunset and the beauty of creation and the mountains and our own bodies and the other things is to only know Him in condemnation. To be without excuse. But then we come to know Him in His salvation. Through the Gospel. Through a right view that He will in fact judge. No one will ever be saved who doesn't believe they need to be saved. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We are stubborn, uh, rebellious human beings. I was a little kid, y'all. I was a little kid. And I got sucked out the inlet at Jupiter swimming at Dubois Park where I should not have been swimming. And rather than holler out, I was embarrassed. I didn't want anybody to know. My flesh did whatever it took. I was like 11 years old. And when I say I got sucked out the inland, I mean, I finally cleared the last rocks and there was nothing but the Bahamas uh, on the other side of me. And listen, at that point, I took my shorts off and I was waving them over my head trying to get a boat. To know. I'm like, well, I don't care. Right? Finally, enough fear of my circumstance and situation kicked in that I was willing to do whatever it took to humble myself, to get it, to, whatever it takes. Somebody help. <laughs> in the same way, if you're presenting the gospel, if you're teaching the truth about God, if you're trying to help and labor in others' lives to recognize, you have to begin with the totality of who He is. You can't skip over the things which cause fear. That's what makes it so beautiful when we have verses that say, and we cry out, Abba, Father, and we no longer have a spirit of fear. Right? There's a measure where those things are only true if we start with one, if we rightly see that. So, what does this teach me about God? And number four, how do I apply this to my life? Uh, We're going to take a quick break uh, for you all, five minutes, restroom, uh, whatever that looks like, and then we're going to jump into... Uh, How do we walk through um, understanding the difference in interpretation 
and application. I think those are some of the most misunderstood realities uh, that we face. So ladies, take five minutes and uh, we'll get right back to it. And uh, just trying to keep it at a, at a foundational level. Don't forget in this class, if you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand in the midst of it. Um, and, and those things also recognize this is a six week course. So there are things that you may have questions about, like how do I know what the Bible says about this in other places that we're going to teach you next week through how to do a word study, cross-referencing, and some other components that you will learn in the weeks ahead. So don't look at this in panic and say, I have no idea how to do these things, uh, and he hasn't explained it yet. That's why it's a six-week course, because there's no way that we can... I mean, this is, this is what our elder interns work through one of the books they work through in just sermon prep. So we're bringing it at a foundation so that we can get things going uh, and then grow from that into other components. So um, any questions so far? Can you, you please repeat uh, the five categories that all scripture calls into the character of hello? <laughs> and they will, uh, yes, we'll try and do that with other things that I throw in as surprises. I have a question yes, about the five categories. Um, number two, yourself, mm -hmm. meaning your sinful state? Yes, okay. your sinful state and your safe state, because that leads into the third one and the fourth one. So the third one is when you recognize your sin before a holy God. So the first one teaches about God's character, that He is holy, He is just, He is merciful, He is gracious. You are a sinner. You are choosing less than. You are condemned before His holiness. But it doesn't leave you in that. It gives you the good news of the gospel, God's response to His holiness and your sinfulness. And then coming out of that, what to do about it, that's the other part you're learning. Okay, I'm to put on the whole armor of God. I'm to put off unrighteousness and put on righteous things. I'm to do these things in light of his response of the gospel and then future things uh, what we've been learning in Matthew 24 when you read through the book of Revelation there are yet to come realities that still I mean again those categories are not absolute meaning that there might be one verse that does all five but those are the categories that you need to be looking for in your study yes um, do you recommend any version different versions Bible or NIV or okay, yes. Um, here for our study, we I teach out of the New American Standard 1995. Uh, so the other one that I would recommend is the ESV or if you grew up with the King James. Uh, and the reason for that is those are all what we call literal translations. Uh, meaning except for the King James from the original language, they translate into the literal understanding. The King James, the only difference is the Old Testament is translated from the Septuagint, which is the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew. So you've got a double translation to get to the English. Uh, so we want a literal translation. We'll talk a little bit more about how important that is. Uh, when you get to NIV and some others, you have what's known as a stat or dynamic translation. Static or dynamic? Dynamic. Dynamic. And what that means is they'll take the phrase and say, this is what I think the author meant, and they'll put it into modern language. The problem is, is you start getting into interpretation at that point. Instead of word for word, in, from the original to this, you get into an interpretive reality uh, that obviously is something we want to avoid and work to get to our own uh, arrival at. So uh, ESV, New American Standard, uh, 95, they just came out with a new update that's horrible. Uh, literally, it's an abomination. I, it's, it, and it's got me twice because in one of the uh, apps I use, I didn't realize that they'd come out with a new one. And so I would just click on the NASB, NASB, New American Center Bible, and then I was reading. I'm like, what in the world? It was about three weeks in when a verse came across that I'm like, I know it doesn't say that. <laughs> and I caught, I caught up with it. So um, we're going to talk about why that's important as well. Actually, right now. We're going to get into a beginning level of understanding that. It'll say it. So if you look for example, um, yeah. So it'll say the last revision was 1995. It's most important on an app. If you've got a Bible that you already own, um, it's likely if you haven't bought it in the last 
three months, it's likely a 95 uh, edition. You want 1995? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the last revision. Um, prior to this one that just came out, that is a it's, it's just horrible. I don't even know how they, I, yeah. Um, any other questions before we get into a little more? Yes, ma'am. What's so wrong with the new version? I'm sorry? What's so wrong with the new version of the Nazi? Uh, what it does is it goes into, so they've removed a lot of the gender terms and made them neutral. Uh, and so they've adapted it to be much more culturally appropriate rather than hermeneutically or historically accurate, um, biblically accurate. That's the one thing I've noticed. I don't know the fullness of the rest of it, but when I was studying, uh, I found two verses where it said the, the man of God, and then they added in there the man or woman of God. And it was specific to an elder role, uh, which would be a massive shift in what's been given in Scripture uh, to make it more culturally acceptable. Um, so that was the one that stood out to me, and I don't know how far the rest of it went, um, but I read some of the... Um, reviews on it uh, and there is a new one coming out I have just knowing uh, men like Abner Chow uh, and a couple other guys who are phenomenal uh, in their interpretive abilities and at it for many years they're working on a translation called the legacy Bible that I'm excited about because one of the things it's going to do is just for example if you look in your Old Testament and you'll see every time you see the word Lord uh, the pronoun Lord in all caps you know it means Yahweh well they actually make it Yahweh I think that's just for me. There's certain elements of that that I'm, I think is just better. Uh, it's not a deal breaker, obviously, but at the same time, if I've got one that's doing that, I would prefer it. So it's some things like that. It's not the newness or the oldness. It's just the literal uh, realities and the uh, interpretive uh, means by which they use to, to bring that about. Um, any other questions? Does John MacArthur make a newer version? Uh, no. Okay. No. They, they have study notes um, that are part of what's called a MacArthur study Bible, but he does none of the translation um, at all. He just works through that. And actually, the, the Old Testament study notes are all from Dr. Zemeck, or the majority really? of them are. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Zemeck, he was my uh, professor in theology and uh, apologetics and several other classes and the majority of what you see in the MacArthur Study Bible in the Old Testament are his notes. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, linguistically amazing. He's just an amazing guy when it comes to uh, <laughs> language and study of those things. Um, I'm not. I'm thankful for him. Um, Alright. Jumping in. So next week you guys are going to get more fully into uh, word studies, cross-referencing, cross other things. So in this section, you're going to see that there are things to look for. And for whatever reason, in the printing, if you look on the left-hand page, it said keywords that are uh, doctrinal, unfamiliar, cultural. That should be on the right-hand page. The, the printing process, for some reason, just flopped that. So those keywords, that little uh, five dots... You should be looking at this page right here. This should be over here. We've kind of walked through uh, presuppositions. Those are things that you bring to the text. There are proper ones and there are improper ones. Proper ones are just a, a recognition, as we said, that this is God's word, therefore it is true. Uh, God has given it to us so that we might know him, therefore it is understandable. Uh, this is in agreement with the rest of Scripture. This is not a contradiction. I am not a Gospel of John guy versus a Gospel of Matthew guy. And I hope that one of the things you've seen in our exposition of Matthew, especially in the recent weeks, is how all of those texts complement each other. And they do bring a slightly different perspective or slightly different fulfillment in the author's intended design or desire for that text uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, but within that, they, none of them contradict ever. Um, so this agrees with the rest of Scripture. This is going to reveal something about God. I'm excited. I'm going to learn something about God today. When I open my Bible, this is what's going to happen. Uh, there should be an excitement with that, and this is going to reveal something about me. Um, so 
this is going to be fruitful. It's profitable, right? That's what we come with an expectation ahead of time. Improper presuppositions. I know how this word is used today, so I know what it meant then. I got this nailed down, right? And we see how language changes. An easy example are words like cool, uh, right? It means something different depending on which generation you're from. Uh, there's some similar realities in Scripture. And so we need to uh, not come with presuppositions along that. We want to come with as blank of a slate in the specifics as possible. My experience is a trustworthy lens through which to understand what is being said. Oh my goodness. Huge struggle. We're going to talk about that one in just a minute. Uh, this is all about me. Um, I'm, I'm going to be careful. But there are a lot of especially, not just Old Testament, but especially Old Testament texts that have been adapted to mean something they were never intended to mean. Uh, some easy examples. I've had people say to me when asked about why we have plurality of leaders and we go to the multiple texts that deal with elders and the plural sense and, and all of those pictures. Uh, and then I'll ask them, well, what's your basis for a singular view? And they'll say things like, well, I take more of a Moses style of leadership. Here's the problem. They ain't Moses. Right? I, there's no other way to say that. I don't mean that in a... Well, I do, I guess, mean it in a negative <laughs> sense. And I've said that. I'm like, bro, you ain't Moses. Like, what do you do with that? Tell me about your burning bush. Don't, help me understand here. What led you to believe that that was for you? Uh, some examples that stand out. Um, I've had... Uh, some, you know, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, there is a great deal of that book which is descriptive and not prescriptive. We recognize that, right? I'm not looking for tongues of fire to pop out above someone's head before I recognize that they're making a sound profession. Right? There, there is a descriptive versus prescriptive, and we recognize that. An easy example, and it's so funny because people will jump to making prescriptive what they want to be prescriptive, and then not other things. For example, uh, I have yet to meet someone who wants to raise the next Olympian. And so their method in doing that is a Judges 14 method, whereby they'll allow no haircut and allow no fruit of the vine to ever touch their lips. And so through that, they're going to raise Samson. No, we understand that is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Uh, and so there are elements of that that we need to understand. This, this might not be about you. Um, I can remember working with uh, some different firefighters at times. And there is a verse I didn't even really ever stand out to me. A verse in the Old Testament where God makes a promise to Israel that when they uh, walk through the fire, they won't be burned. And so there were some firefighters, not that I know, but some firefighters that some other people knew who had gotten that tattooed on their arm or somewhere on their body, a tattoo of that verse, and claimed it basically for them as a firefighter because it spoke of being protected from fire. What's the struggle? It wasn't written to them. They will get burned, <laughs> right? And then what? What do they say to the other unbelieving firefighters when they're like, bro, what happened to that tattoo? Right? I thought, I thought you were protected by God. How'd you get burned? Because that says you wouldn't get burned, but you did. Because it wasn't made to them, right? It was made to Israel. That's super important. We're going to learn more how to recognize that in the next six weeks coming up. Um, but it might not be about you. It might be about Him, right? It, it might be about Him, meaning God. It might not have anything to do with you in that way other than revealing to you more fully who He is. Um, what this means to me is most important. We're going to talk about that. That's one of the greatest struggles. The majority of modern day Bible studies will have questions like that. What does this verse mean to you? We're never going to go there. Let's just get that. We're never going to go there. Why? It, even if it is, even if it is about you, it's not about what it means to you. What we want to arrive at first is what does it mean? Then we're going to jump to what does it mean to you? Right? And, and there's a reason for that, and we're going to talk about it. And then finally, I'm already nailing whatever I see here. There's nothing more for me here. Um, this is something that we want to labor against. If we ever think we arrive, we talked about this earlier from the Apostle Paul, but we need to take heed. Ye who think you stand, lest you fall. And we don't arrive this side of heaven. We do mature 
things do get easier. We do have greater victory in maturity, and the Lord prunes us so that we produce more fruit. It is who we are. So, what I want to talk about in our final bit of time, it says in bold letters there, we cannot arrive at a proper application without proper interpretation. If we cannot arrive at what the author is saying, we cannot truly benefit from studying the text. This is foundational key necessity. This is where we go from what I was just sharing with you that we want to know what did God say? Through the human author, uh, there's only one meaning of the text, guys. Only one. And guess who gets to determine it? The author. He wrote it. In the same way, think about this. If you write something, you determine what it means. Imagine for just a minute, to use a, a very ludicrous example, but let's say that I'm on a missions trip, and I write a letter back to the church, and I address it to our, my dear brother John. And in that, I write this letter to John and other things, and the church gets it, and they hear it, and it's passed around. And there's a group of people in the church who just really get concerned. And they're super concerned because in reading the letter, they finally address their concern, and they go to the other elders, and they say, we're really concerned about Pastor. Well, why are you concerned? Well, we're concerned, you know, that he's, he's over there, and in, in, he's in Europe, and we know that that there's a great struggle with, with same-sex attraction and things, and, and we're worried that maybe he's uh, getting sucked into a homosexual lifestyle. And everyone would say, what? And they would say, well, well, didn't you read the letter? And they would say, well, I did read the letter. And then they would say, well, didn't you read the part at the end where he said, hey, love you, John, can't wait to see you again? And they interpret that to mean that there's some kind of a uh, homosexual viewpoint coming from me. And I would say with clarity, that ain't what I meant. Right? And I'm the author. I know what I meant. I meant that John's a dear brother and I love him this one. Nothing of any other thing in that. So, in the same way, when it comes to the interpretation, an author-interpreted text is always our goal because it's the authors to interpret. So it's not about us arriving at what does it mean to me, it's about us arriving at what does it mean to the author? What did the author mean when they wrote this? And we're going to talk about context, different circles of context, how we start and arrive at understanding context, grammatically, what is this pointing to? And there's a lot of important realities in that. But for tonight, what I want us to understand is where interpretation differs from application and why we have to get that right. Interpretation is that means by which we arrive at what is the author saying. Application is then how we can apply it into our own lives after the fact of interpretation. Some easy examples. This is one that we use that a, a pastor in South Africa gave several of these. And uh, this one really stands out. It's very simple. It's well known. Uh, in the Ten Commandments, we have one command that says, Thou shalt not steal. What is the interpretation of that? Exactly. Thou shalt not take something that ain't yours. Pretty straightforward. That interpretation, does it change if you are Chinese? Does it change if you're a woman? A man? Does it change the interpretation if you are 14 years old or 54 years old? The interpretation is the interpretation. It's unchanging. Therefore, it transcends culture, it transcends gender, it transcends age. The application, it might mean for a 28-year-old man that he doesn't take a nap while he's on the clock. It might mean for a 12-year-old he doesn't take a candy bar while he's in the store. It might mean any number of things in application, but the interpretation never changes. Do you guys see the difference in the two? And you have to arrive at a proper interpretation or else you can never then bring that to a worthy application. Such an important truth. All right, you guys ready for your homework and how we're going to do that? <coughs> Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. And then I'm going to give you guys an example from my own study of the way that working through what you're going to be learning and how it brings um, these things to light. But here's your homework, and then we're going to take some time to look at what I'm going to be teaching tomorrow night. 
Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. I preached this a couple weeks ago. So one of the things that you need to be striving for in your study, and you're gonna, we're going to talk about outlines and, and getting down to proper pericopes or uh, points of thought, but what I want to look at tonight is how do we get to a place where once you've got that, and I'm just going to tell you, Galatians 1, 6 to 10, is, is, it is one of those pericopes. It's one of those singular points of thought. Uh, the text is all pointing towards the same reality. So with that, what's the main idea? So your homework is I want you... To write a summary, what's the main idea? It needs to be two sentences or less. By the time you're done with this class, it needs to be down to one sentence or less. But for now, I'll give you two. Two sentences or less. What's the main idea of Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 10? What's the, you've heard Ransom say, big, what's the big idea? And he'll summarize a whole chapter in the, in the book of um, Genesis into trust God. That's kind of the picture you want to see here. What's the main idea? Now, this might be a little more complex. You might come up with two sentences worth of describing the main idea, but you need to arrive at what's the main idea. Here comes the fun exercise. I want you to rewrite Galatians 1, 6 to 10 in your own words. Right? Big danger. Big danger. This is everything I just told you not to do. This is everything I just told you not to do. But there's a caveat. You have to start every sentence with Paul said. Every sentence that you do, you have to start with Paul said. You guys see how that is? And here's where you have to be careful. You have to make sure it's what Paul said. If we were grading it, which we're not, that would be a, that would be a definite red ink on there if you say Paul said something he didn't say. In your own words, each verse rewritten that begins with Paul said. And then when you're done with that exercise, I want you to write down three ways that you can apply what Paul said to the Galatians to your life for this generation today. <laughs> After you've done the Paul said rewrite, I want you to write down three ways that you can apply what Paul said to the Galatians, either in your life or this society generation around you. Do you guys see the function? And, and If you don't yet, I think you will as you walk through that. And we'll put it up there. We'll, yep, and we'll put it up on the board at the end too. So your homework is, number one, you have to arrive at a two-sentence or less main idea. Number two, you have to rewrite these verses, 6 through 10 of Galatians chapter 1, in your own words. But you have to begin each sentence with Paul said, being careful to only write what Paul said. And number three, then, or at the conclusion of having done that, write down three ways you can apply what Paul said to the Galatians to yourself or this society, this generation uh, at large. So we want to start with interpretation, go to application. If we go to application first and then interpretation, you'll end up with a mess. Uh, let me give you a, jump with me to Romans 12. I'll give you an example that was super helpful to me the first time I did this. This is a pretty well-known text. Just the first two verses. Therefore I urge you, brethren. This is, by the way, this is the one that our elder interns work through. Um, I just picked something else I've walked through recently that wasn't like a narrative account, which I've been in Matthew. Uh, so Galatians was the most recent one I'd done. It was a small section, so I didn't give you like 23 verses to rewrite. <laughs> Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, here would be a wrong interpretation of this. Uh, the person who first gave this to us used an example. He had heard a sermon one time that said, what Paul's saying here is that you should not watch television shows that bring to mind a, world view, a worldly worldview. 
Is that what Paul meant to the Romans when he wrote it? How do you know? They didn't have television back then, right? Is that possibly a proper application that we're not to be conformed to the world and therefore if there's a worldly uh, television show or movie or something else that you're pouring in through your eyes, certainly that could be a great application, but it is a wrong interpretation. And so when you begin with Paul said, well, Paul didn't say that. And so it forces you, you're going to be surprised how much it forces you into possibly rethinking what you think of those verses from a casual reading. Uh, it's a great exercise. I encourage you all in it. Any, any questions before we jump to uh, just a few things and close out? I just want to clarify the passage. It's Galatians 5, 1, verses 6 to 10. Right? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So these five that they put into, if you were to have one verse, you, could you ever figure out which one it fell into, or do you have to go to the verses around it? Can you ever interpret one verse from the verses? You would be in grave danger. In other words, you might get it right, but there's no way to confirm that without going to the verses so around these it. These four, we have to go around it. As well. We're going to get the context in the future for what I want you to do tonight is, or for the next week is just work on you taking those verses and rewriting them in an interpretive way uh, and not going to the totality of the context and other things. Uh, you can uh, if you have that, but I want you to focus on these specific verses without going into anything else uh, because we're going to teach that in stages and so I don't want to jump ahead of the process. Alright, you ready for some fun? You get to see my misery at the moment. Turn with me to Psalm 37. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so Psalm 37 is an amazing it's scripture. It's profitable, right? It's amazing. It's good, as we've learned. Uh, but it has a very specific um, theme to it that's pretty clear. I mean, it begins with the very first verse. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be amused towards wrongdoers. And that's kind of the theme throughout. And so this is a passage that I have gone to so many times for encouragement in my own heart. And it's a simple encouragement and the way that I've gone to it in years past of when the bad guys seem to be winning, yeah. I can go here and be encouraged that they're not going to. <clears throat> That's not wrong, is it? That's basically what you see in Psalm 37. And, and it's great. And it's just encouraging. It's just one of those reminders, uh, you know, that this is... This is real. It's, it's certainly we're in a broken world that's going to get worse. And until Jesus does the final restoration, uh, it's going to go from bad to worse. Um, and, and we're going to see that. <clears throat> but I decided for no particular reason that I'm going to share tonight that tomorrow night might be a good time to teach Psalm 37. And so with that, I looked at preparing to teach it. And I took this beautiful, amazing, wonderful psalm that's been such a comfort to my heart, and I began to apply the things you all are starting to learn to it. Oh my goodness. It has ruined and made this psalm much more effective for me. Because it's no longer an easy go-to, I'm encouraged, God's going to win, this is great, let me get on about my life. Now, none of that changed. But suddenly I begin to realize, whoa, this whole chapter has application to me through the interpretation. In other words, my not fretting is because of very specific commands that God's given me to actually do in Psalm 37. And so I don't get to just go to it and read it ever again and leave encouraged. Now I understand more fully that encouragement is not the point. My sanctification is the point. And it's through a right understanding of Psalm 37 that sanctification is going to be carried out. So let me give you a preview of what tomorrow night 
if I can get it put together in time because it's grown into something much more than I thought it was going to be in my foolish, casual, uh, read it 500 times observations regarding it and then begin to apply. I'm going to teach it. So let's start breaking it down through some of the things that you all are learning and will continue learning. So what we recognize, number one, is sometimes the bad guys win. Right? That's an easy... Sometimes... Sometimes... It doesn't go well, right? And that's what brings us to Psalm 37 when we're struggling that, man, I can't believe that guy got the promotion. I can't believe that she, she lied and they believed her and I'm suffering the consequences of it, right? These are realities that we do face. Certainly none of us in this room are exempt from some of those realities, right? Sometimes uh, the people who do wrong prosper, you recognize that you might try and run your business above board and do all the things that you can and there's someone over there cheating, lying, and stealing and they're the ones driving the new car and you're not. Just a multitude of examples in any given room. With that, sometimes the bad guys win. What Psalm 37 calls us to is that when they do, we must be those who trust in the Lord. Verses 1 through 11. But how do we trust in the Lord? Right? This is where you have to get beyond the, the cliche sayings of I will trust in the Lord. Right? Because we, some areas where we see that, people will make a statement and they'll say things like, oh, to, to, to God be all the glory. And it's just a statement to them. Right? They're saying, ah, I got my degree, you know, I finished college. To God be the glory. He did it. Well, is there a real recognition of that in that cliche statement? So when we say things like, when the bad guys win, we have to trust in the Lord. How do we trust in the Lord? Can do good. We're going to get to that. That's, that's the low-hanging fruit. We have to trust in the Lord. Verses 1 through 11 says we do so by putting off sin. We are not envious. We do not carry irritation. And we certainly do not give ourselves over to anger. Uh-oh. <laughs> right? In, in that, we trust in the Lord because we put on righteousness. What does that mean? Well, we put on trust. We put on obedience. We put on patience. And we put on humility as we delight in the Lord. Oh my goodness, Psalm 37 just was ruined for me. And is actually finally, for the first time, starting to do the work that was intended. Now I don't have to go to it 500 times because there's going to be fruit born of it as I'm putting into practice, instead of just going there to be encouraged, oh yeah, God's going to win. Okay, let me get on about my life. No. This is how I put away fret and worry in the midst of the brokenness of this world. How do we continue doing that? Well, verses 12 down to 26, when they do happen to prosper, we must be confident in the Lord. What's that confidence look like? Or verses 12 to 15 says that He will judge them. And verses 16 to 26 reminds us that He will provide for us. He is our hope. He is our prize. He is our portion. When they do win, we must be those who act right. Verses 27 to 40. And the overall main theme, trust in the Lord, the righteous judge, for He will judge unrighteousness and reveal righteousness. And you'll see that in verses 2, 9, 10, 12, 15, 17, 20, 22, 28, 34, 35 to 36, and 38. Therefore, I know that's the main theme of this text. You guys kind of understand just from that? And I'm 20% of my way into this. And it's already... So this will probably change a lot by tomorrow night. If I have the time to get there. If not, we'll do a Q&A and you'll know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but does that make sense? Does that kind of give you a little bit of a picture? If you're familiar with Psalm 37, it might give you a more complete. Psalm 37 is, that's my song. For these struggles in, in a variety of ways, in a multitude of ways, both personally, ministerially, and nationally, universally, from missions to you fill in the blank. This is where I go when I'm discouraged. Now that hasn't changed. This is still where I need to go when I'm discouraged by those things that are 
hindrances and, and holding back uh, goodness from going forward. The gospel from going forth into this country because there's so much corruption. God, why don't you just do away with the corruption so we can get missionaries in there now? Right? And so this still is the psalm I need to go to for that. But now I have to also recognize it calls me to do work. It calls me to do the work that will bring the sanctification from this. You guys tracking? Ransom, don't be back there checking my work. I'm 20% in, bro. I'm, I am not ready. I'm not ready to stand on that yet. <laughs> but I am, I am uh, moving forward in it. <laughs> Lord willing. Any questions? We're going to end with that tonight. Um, just a little insight, a little glimpse into uh, some of the ways. Another thing that just might be interesting, um, the marriage conference messages that you all heard were not the ones that I prepared in August or September or whenever we were supposed to have it. <clears throat> different text, different theme, different everything. Not because God's word changed, but because the shepherding of the flock had brought different burdens in a way that made me shift my focus from this text to this text that's part of it you're going to experience that through your study that's why isn't it amazing he gave us all of this because we need all of this all right any questions